Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. I'm glad you joined us as we continue our series on Genesis today, The Covenant and Abraham. It's going to be an exciting study, and I'm glad you're with us. So welcome to Hope Sabbath School. Welcome to the team. And you'll notice we have a special guest with us on the team today, Pedro and Patricia's little girl, Bianca. Can you wave at everybody, Bianca? That's mm. right. Bianca was on, a guest on our Hope Sabbath School when she was three months old, and now she's three years old. And she loves Jesus, right? Yes, <laughs> you do. And she brought her little monkey, baby, to be with us. So we're just so thankful. And Bianca, I just am so thankful that many boys and girls are watching Hope Sabbath School too. Could you give them another wave? Just wave to them, the boys and girls that are watching. Yeah, that's right. I want to also welcome our remote participants who are joining us uh, as part of the team. I want to welcome Shana from up in sunny Maine. Yeah, we're glad you're with us, Shana. And Pastor Puya from Hawaii, good to see you. And also Jonathan joining us from Maryland. We're glad you're with us. You're some of our core remote team members. We're glad you're here. And Travis, we're especially excited that you're going to be teaching the study today. It's going to be a great study of the Word of God. I didn't share with you that this whole series is being taught by team members, did I? That's making Genesis history because we've never done that before. Our goal is to encourage you to start an in-depth interactive class in your area. Download the outline from our website, hopetv.org slash hopess. You can use the same outline we're using in our class. And by the way, while you're there at the website, click on the free gift button in the middle of the screen, and you can get a free copy of the wonderful resource, Patriarchs and Prophets. And the first 21 chapters of that book, Patriarchs and Prophets, deal with the book of Genesis. So it's a great gift for you. I think there's more than 20 languages you can choose from or the audio book. So go to hopetv.org slash hopess, click on the free gift button, and you'll receive that special gift. Well, here I put a note on our Facebook page. We have 180 some thousand followers on our Facebook page. And I said, how many of you appreciate the media team? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they never show up on the camera, but we've got them directing and doing the audio and doing all the camera work. And here's just a few very short comments responding on the Facebook page. Miriam writes from Mauritius. Many thanks to you, dedicated media team. God give you health and courage. Amen. Udaya from Nigeria. Thank God for the media team. May God bless you with wisdom. Tanish Tenshi writes from the Philippines. I love Hope mm -hmm. Sabbath School. Thank God for the dedicated media team. Well, I'm going to just read one last one from Marie Annette in Seychelles. Seychelles, that's in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Yeah. She writes and says, Thank God Almighty we have access to Hope Channel in the Seychelles. May God bless the media team that helped put everything together. Amen? Amen. Amen. We just want to say thank you <laughs> to our media team because without them, we just have a great Bible study here with a few of us. Mm -hmm. But as, as a result of their dedicated ministry, 200 plus countries are impacted, so thank you. Well, here's a regular note. Daniela from Venezuela, I found you a few months ago because I'm learning English, but since then I've been watching every Friday night. Every week I learn more about God and the Bible, and I also practice my English. Mm -hmm. I'm truly happy to be part of the Hope Sabbath School family. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for writing to us, Daniela from Venezuela. Here's a note from a donor couple in Florida, in the United States of America. They write and say, we've been watching regularly since the health pandemic started and we weren't able to attend church. It's been such a blessing to both of us. We especially appreciate the Christ-centered presentations each week, no matter the subject of the lesson. It's wonderful to have a site, no matter what a person's background or denomination is, God's love and a personal relationship with Christ is central. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, donor couple from Florida, along with our donation. Please know you're always in our prayers and a donation of $200 wow. Amen. to bless the ministry of Hope Sabbath School. Thank you, donor couple, and thanks to each one of you who partner with us 
hopetv.org slash donate or go to our Hope Sabbath School website, push on the button. One note from Australia, just a short note, Jenny writes and says, hi, Hope Sabbath School team. Hello. I'm from Adelaide, the capital of South Australia. I love your program. I'm a regular watcher. Blessings to you all. And one last note from Gary in Michigan. This is a little bit of a sad note, but it's a note of hope. Gary writes, and he said, my wife and I watched Hope Sabbath School for many years. My wife died three and a half years ago. She always spoke highly about Hope Sabbath School. Before she died, she was blessed her sister was baptized. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, that's going to be a joyful resurrection day for uh, Gary's wife, isn't it? And for all of us, those that we've shared the gospel message with who've trusted Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right now, I need you to sing a song with us, though, as we go into our study on Abraham and the covenant. It's uh, by the sons of Korah, 3,000 years old, but it's got a new tune. It says, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. <laughs> For the Lord most high is awesome. He's a great king over all the earth. Mm. Let's sing it together. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph, for the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great King over all the earth. For God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a voice of triumph, for the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great King over all the earth. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a voice of triumph, for the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great King over all the earth. He is a great King over all the earth. He is a great King over all the earth. We're going to study about that God, Lord God Most High as we study about the covenant in Abraham, and I know we'll be blessed. Travis, lead us in prayer as we begin. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you today with humble hearts. Lord, the covenant that you made with Abraham is also a covenant with us, who by faith are the seed of Abraham. And we know that covenant promise was kept through Jesus, and we ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would be here to teach us more about this faithful promise that you've kept faithfully uh, through the ages and will keep forever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Again, the lesson title, The Covenant with Abraham. And I believe that that covenant is with us as well. Amen. 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 And we're going to start with Shana. If you would read uh, Genesis 15, 1 through 6, we're going to read, well, maybe to some a strange story, but I think as we develop the story, uh, that will make some sense out of what's happening here. Would you read that for us, Shana? Genesis chapter 1, or 15, 1 through 6. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Mm -hmm. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. 
And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Mm -hmm. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Well, Mm. Well, what do we see here? What truth is conveyed through this interaction between Abraham and God? Mm. What truth is conveyed? Jonathan. It's an interesting picture of, of where God takes this, this man and, and proclaims a truth that he's like, can't believe, like how is this supposed to be? And he believes and God counts it to him as righteousness. So it's it's kind of this um, acting out of a parable of, of how God um, counts righteousness to us. I mean, we can see that Abraham isn't perfect, but now here God is saying he is counted as, as being righteous. And I think it's a beautiful picture. And just one more thing. I, I think it's interesting that here he wouldn't have been here if he hadn't followed God in the first place, step by step. Right. And now he's able to be where God can speak to him. Mm, so he had learned from his past interactions with God that he was faithful mm -hmm. and he believed in the faithfulness of God. Mm -hmm. Yes, Puya. In the culture surrounding Abram at that time, uh, most of the or almost all the other uh, gods, supposed gods, uh, never entered into a covenant type of relationship or promise to the people who followed them. And it's very interesting that here God came down to Abraham and promised him that he's going to give him uh, descendants and blessings. And this is going to be um, uh, a blessing for all nations. And then it's, it's in stark contrast to the other type of religion where you have to earn your way to salvation by performance or by appeasing the gods. Uh, the God of Abraham, Abraham at this point is very different in a sense that righteousness or uh, coming to God is not through performance, but through faith resulting in obedience. But uh, that's, that's uh, I believe, what is interesting here. Mm, isn't that beautiful that that idea of righteousness by faith starts way back in the book of Genesis and it's consistent throughout all of scripture. Um, Derek and then John. You know, I was just thinking, this is an amazing promise God is making. It would be like a professor coming to a failing student and saying, you're going to graduate with honors. That's right. <laughs> and, and because the student believes that the teacher sees past his temporary struggle, he, he actually believes, he says he believed the Lord. Uh, I just think it's wonderful and a wonderful example for each one of us. When the Lord gives us a glimpse of some amazing plan he has for us, that we just say, I'll believe the Lord. Amen. By faith. Yeah. Yes. We believe in his faithfulness. John, and then we have to move on. You know, often it is said that the New Testament talks about grace, but not so much the Old Testament. But we find here that the method of obtaining righteousness or salvation has been the same both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is only by faith in Christ. Amen. Actually, that's the theme throughout Scripture. It's consistent through all of Scripture. Well, this story gets more in interesting, Jason, and I'm going to have you read uh, uh, Genesis 15, 7 through 17, but it takes an interesting twist. And let's uh, go ahead and read that. The New King James Version says in Genesis chapter 15, verses 7 through 17, Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, 
and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Well, this, this story seems real strange. We're cutting some animals. Abraham is passing between them. And then he's put into a deep sleep and he sees this smoking oven and this flame pass through. Does any, can anybody explain to me what is happening here? Is there, is there uh, some kind of a story, um, something we may not be familiar with um, that can help us figure out what's going on? Puya. Uh, basically, the, the big picture here is God is uh, uh, teaching Abraham a uh, sacrificial system that points forward to the promise that one day there will be uh, uh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, who would uh, be the sacrifice, who would carry away the sins of the world. And, and through this uh, cutting of the animal into two parts, God is initiating or ratifying the covenant promise between him and Abraham. And when it comes to the idea of a burning torch and the smoke, that usually represents the presence of God. And I believe it signifies that God was going to keep his end of the promise and he was going to walk with Abraham all the way. Mm -hmm. Amen. Pedro. I see something very interesting here uh, on this text because obviously at the start of the chapter, uh, there's not saying what's happening. There's just talk, come and talk to Abraham. But when God comes to talk to him and says, do not be afraid. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. So God says, I am your reward. I think probably Abraham was thinking, well, I'm getting old. I don't have no child. God, what is going to happen? He came and talked to him. He says, mm. I am your reward, not your child. And he comes and we see the child exchange with uh, Abraham here, and he's telling, I'm going to bless you with many children. Don't worry about that. But mm -hmm. I wanted to focus on the reward. And that's when he comes and asks to him to come and bring the offer. And we see the aspect of patience here. It says, the offer will come, and will come the right time mm -hmm. that God will bring the fire. And we see the imagery here of, of salvation being given to Abram at that time. He was being taught by God the plan of salvation, and his reward was not a child, but reward was Jesus and his saving grace. Mm, amen. But is there some significance to the cutting and the passing through? Abraham passes through, the Lord passes through. Is there some significance with, with the whole process, Jason and the Jonathan? Yes. So one, uh, building off what uh, Puya said, a lot of this language, it seems kind of strange, darkness, fire, but this is language that we see in other places in Scripture when God specifically interacts with someone like he did Moses at the burning bush. So God's having a specific interaction here and then this whole ceremony. So back uh, in certain time periods when you didn't have like writing and signatures, you would have a covenant, you'd have an agreement, mm -hmm. and you would actually have some kind of ceremony to confirm or to ratify to make this official. And so God is sort of almost giving like, uh, if you will, a legal demonstration of his promise to Abram and letting Abram actually participate in this process of saying, look, I've promised this, I'm going to make it sure, and here's the demonstration, and I'm going to use some mm -hmm. sacrificial symbols and language, and I'm going to interact with you and show you uh, my promise. It's not uh, confirmed, it, it's not taking place there, but he's confirming this promise is still sure. Mm, so there's an agreement. We're going to come to Jonathan and Sabina, and then we're going to explain this story. Mm -hmm. Jonathan. Yeah, I, I believe this is building on a cultural practice that they had for confirming covenants where you would have these animals that you would cut and then the, pe the two people would walk between them. And I believe it symbolized that if you broke that covenant, then the same thing would kind of be happen to you, that it, you're, you're, you're establishing this, this pain to yourself 
if you break the covenant and 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 I think it can kind of symbolize forward in time that that this covenant would cost God to um, establish beautiful John life that, that's what I was looking for yes Sabina I also see here Travis maybe something pointing towards the event that God is announcing them which is you know the time that they were going to be slaves in Egypt further when we read in Exodus and the truth is that God the deliverance that he you know um, that he executed there for them is through passing, crossing uh, the Red Sea. So I also see he maybe here maybe like some indication of God's way of delivering them. Maybe that he w his presence was going to pass in front mm. of them. He was going to open that sea, mm -hmm. and that's also pointing to Jesus because we know that that event, the passing over, it was also indicating that God was going to remove us from mm -hmm. slavery of sin and bring us to a safe land with all the possessions Amen. and conquers that Jesus only can give us. So. All part of the covenant promise. So. Uh, I agree with all of it, but I, Jason and, and uh, Jonathan, I want to build on what you're talking about. Back then, they would they would cut an animal in two if they were going to make an agreement, and they would pass through, and and one would say to the other, if if uh, what if I make a if I break my covenant, my promise with you, may what happened to the animal happen to me, and uh, it's significant. God passes through there, and if you go to the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, chapter nine, twenty six and twenty seven. It says the Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. He was cut off because of the Abrahamic side of the covenant. The man's side of the covenant was not kept. So it's really significant. This is more than just some gory story. It's God promising that he would be faithful. And even if man is not faithful, that he would keep man's side of the covenant. It's a beautiful story of God's grace and God's love and faithfulness. Amen. Amen. Um, so, so was Abraham's uh, faith a gift from God, or was this something developed over time? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Patricia says yes. Um, so I believe that it, it's a gift from God. The Bible tells us that He gives us all a measure of faith, but at the same time, the Bible also compares faith to a seed. And if it's a seed, then it's something that's meant to be cultivated and grow. So. Mm -hmm. And speaking of development, we've seen the story of Abram and we've seen how God is developing his character through experiences, building his faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, we're going to move on. Abraham and Sarah also have doubts. They have faith, but they also have doubts. And I know many of us ex have experienced that in our Christian walk. Nancy, I'm going to have to, I'm going to ask you to read Genesis 16, 1 through 4. Genesis 16, 1 through 4. Okay, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Mm. Mm. Wow. Why is it? always a mistake um, mm. to do things your own way. Mm. Pedro. We see a repetition here through the books of, of, uh, of Genesis. Uh, there's a lot of lessons we can learn here. We see, for example, for Abraham, he, he did not go to God again. Mm. And, and Sarah, oh, she, she, she probably in her mind, the way that we they finished the verse 4, in her mind says, I might not be the problem with my husband, let's try. And, and she fell on her face in, in some ways. But we see here the aspect of, of being, uh, asking God. God, God, at the beginning of chapter 15, says, do not be afraid. And, it, and I will say in the same words, do not be worried. And she, they become worried because of age and did not go to God. And we see results of it. Are you saying we don't have to help God with his promises? <laughs> he could fulfill them on his own, can't he? Amen. Derek and then Shana. You know, uh, Travis, it's not only a bad idea 
to try to work things their own way. Mm. But, but if you read the history of the descendants of Ishmael, child of Hagar, mm -hmm. and the descendants of Isaac, the child of promise, you, you, you have generations of conflict. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just plead with, with everyone listening to say it is always best Mm -hmm. to ask God, what do you want mm -hmm. me to do? It is always best. Mm -hmm. And if the answer is, I'm not sure, then wait on the Lord yeah. <laughs> until He makes that clear. Mm -hmm. Because this, this didn't just cause conflict between Hagar and Sarai. Mm -hmm. It says the despised, right? It, it caused generations of conflict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. And the, one of the wisest men in the world, Solomon, wrote a proverb. Maybe Shana will quote that from, for us uh, during her comment. But uh, it is always best to trust God, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. Shana? To continue in the trajectory that Pastor Derek was going, it's so, it's the greatest thing to just trust what God says because we also have to remember He knows the future. And if He's telling us to go down, this is the path that you should go, He's also considering each and every single individual that's involved in that situation. He knew Hagar, he knew Sarah, and he knew what his plan was. It was the ultimate plan. And if if Abraham had been faithful and just waited, you know, it would have saved the the descendants from going through what they eventually went through. But we have such a limited view of reality that we think, you know what, God, as you said, um, as you said, you know, let me help you out. But God is just like, no, I don't need your help. Just just do this and, and you'll be good. Mm. Does anyone remember the proverb 1412? Mm -hmm. Yes, Sabina. So I think you are quoting from Proverbs 1412. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in a way of death. And we're I think that speaks exactly to the experience of Sarai, even because she was thinking she was bringing mm. a solution. And she ended up bringing uh, problems even to her own self, because we're going to see further down in the story that she also suffers with her suggestion. Mm. Not only we are going to see the conflict that is caused after many generations, but she also had a way for death for her own self with suffering. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, this, well, not counts getting, gaining counsel from God always has its consequences, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And, well, uh, their story illustrates a false teaching about salvation. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. let's read about that in Galatians. Uh, John, would you read for us Galatians 4, 22 to 26? Mm -hmm. And we want to see... Uh, what is that false illustration of salvation? Galatians chapter 4, verses 22 to 26 from the English Standard Version. It says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate, one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now unto you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. So how do their choices here in, in, uh, in this story illustrate a false teaching of salvation based on Galatians? How do they? Anyone? One is salvation by works. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. other is salvation by faith in what God accomplishes. We can't save earth. ourselves, can we? Okay. And, and sometimes we think we've got a better plan than God's plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. But we don't. I think of the verse in the Bible that those who attempt to be justified by the law fall from grace. Mm -hmm. We need to depend on God alone. Jason. 
You know, the verse says, uh, born according to the flesh, and the flesh there means our own ways of doing things, mm -hmm. our own thoughts, our own plans. And we've seen here, this is one of the struggles of Abram and his family is, will I do things my way or will I do things God's way? Mm -hmm. Well, can someone share with us a time when uh, they attempted to do things their own way instead of trusting in God? Mm. I know that we've all had an experience. Maybe we won't <laughs> want to share it today on Hope Sabbath School, but is there anyone willing to share a time when they trusted their own way uh, instead of trusting in God, and what were the consequences? Anyone? That's happened to me a lot. Yes, John. You know, as I was reading this, I, I remember, you know, there are times when we fall, we ask God for forgiveness, but we don't live like we have been forgiven or have a sense of forgiveness. Mm. That shows that we, we don't trust in God's promises of forgiveness, but we are trusting in our own feelings and in our own works because we didn't do things right. Mm. Praise the Lord. I think we're learning that, John, through this study, is that, you know, we often think about our own faithfulness to God, but the gospel is not about our faithfulness to God. It's about God's faithfulness to yeah. us. That's what the covenant yeah. promise is all about. Mm -hmm. Amen. Sabina. Yes. And I think it, it's a reminder for us also to be very open to God's grace because indeed God's grace is so abundant. It's hard to understand. And sometimes what happens is that when we face all these good gifts from God, we may be wondering if he is really like, is God really able to do all that for me? Because I'm such mm -hmm. a big sinner. I'm such a horrible person. If I you know, serve in my heart. There is always something that needs to be, you know, fixed there. But is there a God who really cares about me and can do something for, mm -hmm. for this type of heart? So I find here in the example of Sarah, uh, according to the flesh, as Jason was saying, that she was just not trusting that a great God that they served could really do what he promised, was, which was to make them a great nation. So for us, I think it's good, the reminder that our great God is able to save us. So we don't need to lean on us or anything else. He's yeah. able. Yeah. And we don't want to put too much blame on Sarah. She might have actually learned that from her husband who said, mm -hmm. tell him that you're my sister. I mean, yes. mm -hmm. you know, as the husband, right? The spiritual leader in the family. I mean, I mean, we share those things, yes. unfortunately, with, with each other. Derek, mm -hmm. and then we're going to move on. So I just want to say, we're not going to study a lot more about Hagar and Ishmael, but the Lord hears Hagar's cry oh, when she's in the in wilderness. Yeah. And the Lord says, I'm going to bless Ishmael and his descendants. So mm -hmm. I just want to say that God loves all of his children. Mm -hmm. And though that plan was not a good plan in terms mm -hmm. of God's purpose, we ought not to think that those people are in some way rejected or unloved yeah. by God. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's really Thank you for sharing that, yeah. Derek. Pedro, would you read Genesis 17, 1 through 9, please? Genesis 17, 1 through 9. What does this conversation teach us both about the Lord and also about Abraham? I'll be reading from the New King James Version, uh, Genesis 17, 1 through 9. When Abram was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make a covenant between me and you, and I will, put, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked to him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall, your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make, you, make a nations of you, and kings shall come from you. Mm. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you, and their generations, and for an everlasting covenant. To be, to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, 
after you throughout their generations. Nancy, what does this teach us about the faithfulness of God and about Abraham? God is faithful to us and it's, it's so kind of him to remind Abraham, Abraham, Abraham now. And I wanted to say earlier that he not only told him you know, verbally, but he also gave him an object lesson. He said, look up into the sky and look at how many stars. So that every time that Abraham looked to the sky, he could remember God's promise to him. Mm. Um, I also wanted to say that um, when God promises something to us, we, we need to know that God is able to function outside of what is considered normal and what is considered mm. <laughs> scientifically, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, sound. Obviously, a woman who is 90 and a man who is 100 years old aren't in their prime. And, and who has ever heard of a woman? It, it, it couldn't happen. And so what, what she, what Sarai did, which was laugh when, when it was suggested that she could have a baby at that age, you know, it's, it's kind of logical that, that she would do something like that. But, but God isn't a God of, he's not mm. restrained by, Amen. by anything. Yes. Thank you. Puya and then Shana. Uh, in verse 7 of uh, chapter 17 that we just heard, uh, there's a specific word that God used to describe this covenant promise by describing it as an everlasting covenant. Mm. And this is uh, interesting because the promise that God is making uh, through uh, Abraham is not just for him and his own descendants, yeah. but also for all peoples mm. of the world, regardless of where people are from. And this is going to have an everlasting uh, result to bring eternal, everlasting life for people who wants to be a part of this covenant that God is uh, uh, making with Abraham. Hmm. Shana. This shows me God's heart. Um, first, he is bestowing all these things to Abraham. He's making this, prob this promise that you know, your descendants are going to be kings. <laughs> like, what a promise to make to, you know, a mere human being. The God of the universe is telling me that, you know, anybody or a lot of people who come through my lineage are going to be kings. And it also shows how faithful he is because he's establishing a covenant. And, and God is a God who, if he says it, he has to do it. And so it it shows me God's heart and how faithful and how much he really wants to bless Abraham and ultimately all of us. Mm, amen. Yes. You know, there was a British uh, theologian who, who wrote a little book called Your God is Too Small. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's interesting at the beginning of chapter 17 that he doesn't say, I'm Elohim or I'm Yahweh, both of which have powerful messages. Mm. I am El Shaddai. Mm. Mm. I am God Almighty, and God is all that we imagine and more, right? Yeah. And more. But it's interesting that, that speaking into an impossible situation, he says, I am El Shaddai. Mm -hmm. I am God Almighty. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's a very encouraging message. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Patricia, you had a comment. Yes, I find it interesting that um, Abram and Sarah decide to do their thing and there's the silence on the part of God mm. for a long time. He doesn't try to stop them. He doesn't he doesn't say anything about it. And then when he appears to Abram again a while later, he just repeats the promise all over again mm -hmm. as if nothing had happened. He doesn't even acknowledge Ishmael. And I think he does the same with us when Many times we just try to go and do our own thing because He has given us free will. Mm. He doesn't show up and stop us and say, oh, no, you can't do that. He allows us. And then, of course, we have to suffer the consequences. But He is patient with us, right? Amen. <laughs> he works even through that. John, I'm going to have you read John uh, or, or Genesis 17, 10 through 13. God makes a sign of a covenant. It seems like a strange sign. We're going to these. We're going to talk about that, but read that for us, mm -hmm. and let's talk about this sign that God makes as a covenant. Genesis 17, verses 10 to 13 from the English Standard Version. It says, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you, and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant 
between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from every, any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Mm. Mm. So why did God choose this sign as a covenant? Mm. Anyone? Puya. Um, first, the circum circumcision would involve blood, right? So uh, this this point forwards to the idea that uh, the, the plan of redemption through this covenant will involve the shedding of blood. And I believe it also could point to the idea that uh, this is setting aside, identifying the, the descendants of Abraham as the chosen uh, groups of people uh, to set them aside. And in another text in Deuteronomy, we, uh, we find that God specifically used the word the circumcision uh, of the heart. Right. So I believe this also points forward to the idea that God is trying to work um, symbolically to, to change our hearts, to set us aside for him. Yes, Jonathan. Yeah, I think it um, appeals to, you know, this, this is a very private part of your life. And I think an, an intimate part, and it's, it's appealing to that God wants to be God of the most intimate parts of who we are. And to that, I mean, that's, that's the, the symbol of the heart, the symbol of other things. And so by, by the symbol, this is the core drives the, uh, the most intimate parts of who you are. I want to be that to be mm. mine uh, from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. What a reminder to every male from that generation on that I I'm can't, I, I mean, they would be reminded daily that, well, I can't fill, fulfill the, God's promises on my own, but I must trust in the faithfulness of God to take me through. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, Sabina, could I have you read Genesis chapter um, 18, 1 through 15? Genesis 18, 1 through 15. Okay, so I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says, Then the Lord appeared to him by the turbine trees of Mary, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. And they said, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf with which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, Here, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed with, within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child, since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Mm -hmm. At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Mm. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, 
but you did laugh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think my favorite verse of this whole study is verse 14, right? Yeah. Is anything too hard for the Lord? <laughs> wow. Yeah. If we, I mean, if, if we can remember anything from today's study, is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. Absolutely. Nothing's too hard. No. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Where do we see the immeasurable, unfailing love of God in this story? <laughs> you say everywhere, right? Shana. I mean, God could have went back on his promise. You're laughing, you're mocking me. And so, no, you won't have a son. But he was faithful and he kept his promise that Sarah, even though she was very old and even though she laughed at my promise, even though she essentially mocked me, I will still be faithful and, and fulfill the promises that I made to Abraham. You know, you remind me, Shane, of a verse in the New Testament that even when we're unfaithful, he's faithful because he cannot help himself. Cannot deny himself. He cannot yes. deny himself. That's right. He, it's in the nature of God to be faithful always. Mm -hmm. Jason. I see the immeasurable, unfailing love of God and how God keeps reaching out to Abram. We see, you know, in mm -hmm. the beginning, he speaks to him. We had that situation with the animal rituals. Now the Lord literally comes to him in, in human form and has a meal with him. And so God keeps communicating to Abram in even more explicit ways. I'm doing what I said. I've promised I'm faithful in here. Now I'm here even in your own tent and I'm sharing mm. with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing, Sabina. Yeah, no, I just, I'm also impressed also. It's indeed unfailing love of God because they keep being consistent, right? They are inconsistent from the beginning. We saw Abraham being consistent, right? In the first step after they left Ur, we saw them being consistent after. Even in moments they may have given praise to God or make a, a commitment to God, but right after they would again fall back into the same type of scene, which was being consistent and not mm. trusting God's word. And here comes God once again, uh, fulfilling his promise, just being consistent to what he said. And that speaks to my heart that mm. God is so merciful. <laughs> you know, he could just have walked away from these people and said, you know what, I'm going to choose another family. <laughs> but he kept on investing in them and making sure that the promise was going to be fulfilled despite mm. the odds. You know, Sabina, I was thinking, I was reading through the Genesis account, over and over, God is reiterating to him, you're going to be, have land and descendants, you know, uh, uh, descendants as the stars, as the sands of the sea, and over and over. And I thought, why does he keep saying this over and over? And I think the reason is, is because they kept failing over, and they needed to be reminded. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, isn't that a picture of a loving God? Yeah. Somebody's watching today and thinking, that sounds like me, I've been failing. But God is faithful. Yes. Yeah. We can run to God, right, Derek? Yes, right. <laughs> Just yeah. run to Him. Yes. Don't run away from Don't him. run away. God is faithful, Pedro. Yes. I see one thing that's very beautiful here. God cares about His covenants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And He He intentionally asked about Sarah. Mm -hmm. he, he said, my covenant is not only with Abraham, because Sarah, by this time, she just off. Mm -hmm. 14 years is, is Ishmael. She's like, well, I was, I'm not on this picture. God says, no, you are part of this picture because mm -hmm. I'm faithful in all my covenants. Mm -hmm. And he says, you are also part of this covenant. And I want you to know that I mm -hmm. care for you as well. And you know, she laughed in her heart, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How did that turn out? What was her laughter? What, did, what was it turned to later on? To real Isaac's joy. Name. To the real joy. joy. Yes. Exactly. Promise. And not just alone, but with others. Yes. <laughs> when she had this baby, this promise, Mm -hmm. that God had, had given, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, our story is going to take a little turn mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we're going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. We learned a little bit about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah in our previous study. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jonathan, would you read Genesis 8, 16 through 21 for us? So God comes down to Sodom and Gomorrah, and we want to know, we want to ask the question, well, why would he do that? He already knew their wickedness. Why would he come down? And uh, go ahead, Jonathan, and read that for us, please. All right. I assume you're meaning Genesis 18. I'm sorry. Yes, Genesis 18, 16 right. through 21. Okay. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And then the men set out from there. They looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham surely be 
shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Mm -hmm. So why did God need to come down to the city? He already knew their wickedness. Patricia. Um, I have this quote written on my Bible from Patriarchs and Prophets, and Alan White says, God knew well the measure of Sodom's guilt, but he expressed himself after the manner of men that the justice of his dealings might be understood. Mm. Mm. Okay. So the universe is watching, and, and these two cities are about to be incinerated. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, we're going to get the discussion and again see the immeasurable, unfailing love of God mm -hmm. to save as many as possible. But I think, as Patricia pointed out, that God is very transparent. Let, let's see if it's as bad as the reports, though surely as omniscient mm -hmm. God, he knew the answer to that question. And as you pointed out, Derek, it's gener I mean, it's the whole universe. That's us too. Right. We can take a look at the account, of the account and say, God is showing us that he's just not executing justice without taking a look and making sure that that mm -hmm. is so. Yes, Pedro. And see the beauty of now only God being transparent with the universe. He wants to be transparent with us. That's why he came to Abraham and says, mm -hmm. I want him to know mm -hmm. what I'm about to do. He wants mm -hmm. us to know he wanted to transparent it with us and that show his love and grace through the process. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's John, could I have actually you read Genesis um, 18, 22 to 33. We'll we'll kind of go through the story here a little bit more and see what happens. Genesis chapter 18, verses 22 to 20, uh, 33 from the English Standard Version, it says, So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I am, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty Righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, Suppose 40 are found there. He answered, For the sake of the 40, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again but this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham return to his place. Mm. Well, did Abraham's pleading convince God to be more merciful or was he beginning to demonstrate the unfailing love of Jesus? What's the answer? Puya? what's the answer? Uh, no, Abraham, Abraham did not change God's nature towards uh, people at all. In fact, I would say that the idea of finding righteous people is not, mm. it's not a huge requirement that God has set. Because in the previous context, the reason why Abraham was counted righteous was because he believed mm. if only 10 people had believed in the Lord. Right? God would have spared the city so we can find the immeasurable love of God here. Mm. 
Mm. Amen. Pedro, what was going on in the city um, to confirm that this wickedness was taking place? Well, we see the choice being taking place here. Abraham knew that that city was wicked. And he thought, well, my, 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 my nephew is there. He has at least 50 men on his crew. So he's at 50. And he come down and he noticed that the wickedness not only have come upon that city, but upon the family that have gone there. And he saw that God was still being merciful to him and to his family, even though they have chosen the other way. And God saw the exceeding wickedness of the city, their actions. You know, what happened with Lot and uh, his daughters? What was he willing to do with those two men at the door? Trade them, right? And just give them away. You're thinking, what in the world is going on? But that's what happens when you're living in Sodom, when your sin is around you. You know, Abraham's story, his, the whole story that we've just covered here of God's faithfulness and covenant faithfulness to Abraham is a story for us today. Mm-hmm. He's faithful even when we're not faithful. Right. And even when wickedness is demonstrated, God isn't just some random arbitrary God who comes down and execute justice, but he looks at it. He makes sure that there isn't a chance for them to be saved. God loves people and he wants everyone to be saved and he's faithful. You might be thinking as you're walking through life, I've made a lot of mistakes. Go back, read the story of the covenant of Abraham and you'll, and you'll see that God is faithful. Keep running to God every time you get into trouble. He will take care of you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Thanks Travis. God. And you know, just as the angels, you know the story if you read in Genesis 19, just as the angels pulled Lot and his daughters out of the city. Mm. God is ready to send angels to rescue you. Amen. He loves you. Yeah. He, he'll, he'll, he'll drag you. I mean, he won't force you, but if Lord, I don't know if I can make it out. He's like, let, let me bring you out. Mm-hmm. That, is the, that is the passion of a God who loves us mm. with an immeasurable and unfailing love. What a lesson for our lives today. I just want to praise him, don't you? I just want to say thank you, Lord for your mercy and your grace. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a beautiful picture of your patience and kindness and grace to Abraham becomes Abraham, father of of many nations, and Sarai becomes Sarah. and, And in spite of their frailty, you have a plan that you'll fulfill. Thank you that you have a plan for each of our lives. May we gladly surrender to your will and your leading. In Mm -hmm. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God's got a good plan for you, my friends. You say, it's going to take an angel to drag me out of the mess I'm in. Then cry out to him and let him deliver you. And let the good plan he has for you be fulfilled in your life. And then go out and be a blessing to those around you. 